one night when I was like eight and my sister was 10, it was summertime. Our windows were open and I heard someone walking in the tan bark in front of our windows. We lived way out in the country. So like nobody was ever around ever. And we heard footsteps and panting outside our windows. And I was laying in bed. I was frozen in fear. There's a man under my window going, <sighs> it was so scary. And I see my sister cause the, the hallway went into like an L shape and my sister's bedroom was at the end of the hall. I see her zip across the hallway, like through past my door jam and into my parents room and then I knew it was real because I was like oh shit and I run in there too and my sister's going daddy there's someone else in there. whatever and my dad opens his nightstand drawer pulls out a switchblade flicks it open and goes stay here and it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen it turned out it was a golden retriever and there was no one for him to stab but it was that kind of thing of like he was fucking ready to party Are you ready to party with Karen Kilgariff? On this episode, learn about life, love, and if the dog lived. I'm David Taylor, and this is Until I Lose Interest. Karen Kilgariff. Yes. 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 You are, and I are both fans, I just learned this, of Little House on the Prairie. Uh, na, na, na. A na, great na, show. Na, na, na. You watched it first run? No, no, no. I sure did. I was I think I was seven when it was on TV. It's like it what's crazy about it is how dark it is. Like Oh, my dad used to come up in the middle of every episode and go, Oh, you girls are crying. We have to turn this off every time. And then we go, No, but we both my sister and I would both be sobbing. Really? Because yeah. like, I mean, any show that has a central character a pretty young girl go blind. Yes. What the fuck is that? Oh, you know what that is? That's real life on the prairie. That's they, that they, happens they, fucking every single day on the yeah, prairie. Yeah, but you know, I, actually, I was gonna say they didn't have info mortality, but they did. Oh yeah, they did. Although in life it was fifty fifty, so they kept it like, you know, the, it, until the uh, early twentieth century, it was fifty fifty. Liver dies. A they baby. weren't gonna skirt that on Little House. They did have like a whole thing where like she was pregnant for a while, and Albert or. Uh, that was, that was the rape episode. The rape episode. You mean Albert's girlfriend that gets pregnant and then it turns out her father is a rape and her father is not only raping her, but is a rapist. Okay. I didn't know that one. I'm saying Charles, I was thinking Charles wanted a son and then he was all excited and then the baby died in childbirth. The father was a rapist. You don't remember this episode? You know, it's funny because they did this on Shameless, which I love and the you know the girl gets pregnant. The guy thinks he's the father, and it turns out her father's been raping her. Oh, and it's like played for dark. It's like really dark. I didn't know Little House was doing that on network television thirty yes. years before. It was so dark. It like my sister and I were so freaked out because the, the it started out that there was like a rapist in town, and he was wearing a like a um, Harlequin mask. It's so scary. What? It's so you have to watch it. It's so scary. He's, now I can't remember if it turned out. Yeah, I think it was her father, so or she was, got raped. And her father was like, you are the sinner and you have to whatever. And then it turned out there was this guy that was raping people. I can't remember if it was the father or there was just a Harlequin rape rapist in Tough to say, town. like a combination of things. But anyway, she it got pregnant, she got pregnant with the... Uh... She got pregnant and then Albert said he would marry her because they were like basically 14-year-old boyfriend and girlfriend and everyone was saying she's a slut and Albert slept with her and, and he was like, that's At that point, happen. I don't think... Like my great aunt apparently had her first child at age 14. Whoa. So yeah, yeah, it wasn't uncommon. Eastern Europeans, poor people. And the pioneers, you know, yeah. they were so they, they had to get through those winters. So yeah, so that so did Albert end up marrying her or did No, they moved away. <laughs> Smart move. Or she died. She may have died. Died in childbirth, that's a great saver. Because then I mean, that lets you really have Then the sinner dies. We all get the message that sluts should die. Which I'm all for. Of course you are. She provided her usage to the community. That's right. Uh, we were watching your, you showed me the 30 second little house. The, my favorite, one of my favorite things on YouTube is somebody has compiled or edited down episodes of little house so that they're only 30 seconds long and, and put in sound effects. So when sad things happen, it goes boy, oing, oing. And <laughs> what's incredible is that they got every beat of that episode. They didn't, there was nothing missed. Yes, exactly. The play, I would start on the plague episode if I was you listeners. That's the top one on YouTube. It's so funny. And, that, like but you the, do have to know the show to get why it's so funny. I guess. But if you don't know the show, I don't want to know you. Yeah. Go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> Just like that sinning slut. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that to me. It was like it was incredible because Michael Landon was just like he was a great, great father figure. He yeah. figured out what he did. 
you know, on Bonanza, he was like Little Joe. Yeah. And I think with Little House, they brought it to him. They wanted him to direct. And he said, I want to star. And uh, he was fucking phenomenal. He like, was great. Also, he, you ever get into Highway to Heaven? Not really. I loved Highway to Heaven. It was too Heaven. cheesy. I think I was too old by that Could point. Could be. I was right at the right age. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Victor French, by the way. <laughs> you know who he looks like? I mean, a dead ringer. I think it's a decorator for Victor French. Who? Brody Stevens. <laughs> Brody Stevens absolutely could be Victor French. Oh my in God, a that is so true. The same beard, the same nose, the same personality. I mean, granted, Brody's a little <laughs> the more. Same Asp- personality. Maybe like he'd be like the Asperger best friend of the angel, but still. Very similar, though. You're and right. Either Victor French even wears a baseball cap, which is Brody to a T. Yeah. What if Victor French was from the 818? Yes. <laughs> Till he died. I wouldn't be surprised he was. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that show too. I really love that. You, basically, anything with for me with Michael Landon was was just incredible. Yeah, he well, he knew what he was doing, and also it's kind of like he was get he was good at getting in kids' heads because you could follow it. It was all very clear, like these yeah. moral tales where you're like, I know the right thing to do, and then oh, here comes Nellie, she's going to do the wrong thing. Don't be a Nellie, everybody. Even and then even Nellie's parents followed that. You oh know, man, her mother was such a cunt. She was the definition of a pioneer cunt. Yeah, and then her dad was like such a put upon nice guy, and it's he like he wanted to do good, but he also was like a rich man that was ruled. He was henpecked by a in cunt. a weird way, like an original like Real Housewives. <laughs> <laughs> if only Mrs. Olson would like cry with no tears, with yeah, the, like p- putting her finger up to the bottom of her eye. I think she did some of that. She definitely. Well, she'd get upset if people didn't do what she wanted. And it was also what was so beautiful about the casting was the mom was so pretty. Karen Grassle was yes, so pretty. Karen Ga- Grassle. And she was so like calm and quiet. Uh-huh. She's like the picture. You know, I saw you this. Michael Landon's real name is Eugene Orowitz. And it was like, <laughs> to me, that is that show is the Jewish version of what Christianity is. Yeah. In the same way that like, in some sense, uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas is kind of like that. Even though Schultz isn't Jewish, it's like... It's this weird idealized version of Christianity. As it's as if um, they're saying it's this clean and and well intentioned, yep. and there's no dark side, and there's nothing exact. bad about this religion. It's, it's Linus, only positivity. Yeah. Linus coming up to the stage and reading a Bible verse, and it's like, and yeah. lo, the angel appeared to him and said, yeah, "Yeah, that's so great." My uh, friends from high school went to grammar school with the little boy who was Linus's voice. Is he all fucked up? I know at least one of them. I don't like, think they know him anymore. But he, Charlie they Brown, would make him say lines in the in the are you class. Serious? Yeah, the the voice of Charlie Brown's like a drug addict now. I bet child stardom is is abuse. But too they much, would, too soon. So yeah, <laughs> so Peanut, they, that Peanuts money stacking up. That was that's that was one of the big innovations of Peanuts. You know, was before Peanuts, they used to have women do children's lines, which they still do with The Simpsons. But right. Peanuts use real children's voices, which you know, is so charming and it's fucks up real children. Yeah, fine, it good. is super charming. Make the sacrifice for yeah. my entertainment. Absolutely. Um, with this the is other the thing I was going to say is with, with Peanuts, <laughs> someone has to go. Yeah. And it may what be a six-year-old child. Well, just that a because of Little House on the Prairie, my sister and I made up a fun game um, because we had the same eye color as Mary. And when she went blind, so we used to do a thing where my sister and I would pretend I was blind, and she would walk me around Mervin's, and I would look up at the ceiling and pretend like she was guiding me. And would people believe it? N- I doubt it because we lived in a small town, so okay, it wouldn't be yeah. like, oh, there's a new blind girl in the girls' section of Mervin's. Uh, that was a we loved to do that. We thought it was really a. Uh, we thought it was effective. And then B, my friend Tracy Katsky ended up marrying um, Boomer. Oh, who Boomer was, who created yes, uh, Malcolm in the Middle. Malcolm in the Middle and who was... Um, Al- Albert or Adam. He was one of the sons He was Mary's husband who was also blind at the oh, blind school. Oh, yeah, I knew he was the guy. Yeah. Good yeah. looking guy. Oh, very good looking guy. But it, nothing nothing like Manly. When Manly came along and Laura fell in love with him, remember that? It was the oh. perfect storyline for girls my age because Laura was still like little and in braids yeah. and Manly was a dude. Like Wasn't he the one man. at the school? Uh, I remember Johnny Johnson. That was the <laughs> one where it's like, that's really your name? That's the one you're coming up with? That's what the writers wrote on a yeah, piece of paper yeah. and said, I signed my name to this? Uh, no, Manly came along and started working with Pa, I think, like at the mill or something. And he was like, she just immediately fell in love with him, but she was a girl. And so he was like starting to date people around town and she was like so infatuated with him. And then she eventually like took the braids out. That was like Laura's big change into womanhood. Oh, like that was pulling off the glasses exactly. where it's like, look at you. And then look was at he, Laura. Was it he was, into it? 
it was a whole story arc where at okay. first he was like, you're just a little girl. And then, uh, you know, that had to be eventually. her coming to the producers and being like, I'm tired of these little girl worlds. I'm fucking Rob Lowe in real life. Let's <laughs> step this up. Get rid of these braids. Yeah. yeah. It was very like, that was my, the first sell on like that, um, unrequited love thing where she was just like being tortured by having to see manly every day and him not. The irony too, and Mary her. had a good looking guy. She didn't see at all. <laughs> she was a waste of his looks. He never saw her, and she was pretty too. Yeah, she was quite pretty. Yeah, it's like that's that's kind of and then there's an episode in Thirty Second Little House where the blind school burns down. Oh, I remember that one. God, there it was like they couldn't <laughs> have enough problems. No, there it was, was all never, problems. On there the was prairie. a dust storm. Yeah, oh, there would be a drought that would fuck the town up. We're like, we gotta leave. Yeah, at one point, Charles has to go dynamite mining. Yes, like, that's right. And they kill uh, you know, Chinese why, men. Remember the Chinese oh, men die and then he finally leaves? Yeah, you know, that's why my family came to this country. To blow up Chinese men? No, to, to coal mine. And my great-grandfather, or grandfather, great-grandfather, I think, was was just worked in explosives in the mine. Fuck. And you're like, how did you? And he lived until 90. Yeah, you did. Unlike in Little House. Nobody's living until 90 in Little no, House. No, you can't. Was it a Chinese man or was it like somebody, they, like a friend that they had that really just blew himself up and died? We'd have to rewatch it. Yes, we would. But I feel like that's the one I've seen most recently was was Victor French and Paul. Oh, yeah. Victor French was on Little House, too. Yeah. yeah. He was like, the goofy friend. Like, Let's go mining or wasn't whatever. Wasn't he the one where he was a drunk and his wife died and then he got set up with a prim and proper woman at the yes, town? Yes, Miss Beetle, the old teacher before Laura became the teacher. Oh, was she really? I think so. Didn't he marry Miss Beetle? The one Did with the he? rectangular glasses? Oh, yeah. And then, no, I don't think it was Miss... Maybe it was Miss Beetle. And no, then, I don't know. Yeah, and then they ended up... Uh, she like she wasn't into it and then she was into it. I think it was Miss Beetle. It could be. It possibly was, yeah. You might need to start doing a little house that... Oh podcast there, i would completely there really be on that. is no need for it. <laughs> it's like every show needs to have a podcast of people watching it um a complete sidetrack i was i was looking you up because i was trying to figure out what to talk about i didn't realize you were a big jane dornacker fan oh of course you know how she died right to I me sure do. it's the funniest fucking story it's not funny david it's so funny. It. her insane. last words are so funny what would she say hit the water Oh, fuck. Jane Dornacker, people don't know, was a news traffic reporter. She was like a tall, hot woman, for my impression. Yes. Like, did like. But she was also a stand up comic in San Francisco. All those people, like Jeremy Kramer and uh, in that era, Jeremy Kramer, Jake Johansson, um, it was Robin Williams was around then. She she was like one of the one of the best of that group. Really? Yes. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's driving reporter to New York, and the story was she goes up in the helicopter, and she'd already crashed once, by the way, and survived it. And she, she this is on YouTube. You've heard the YouTube clip, right? No, I wouldn't. It's to super that. funny. It's not uh, funny. It's really, really funny. So she's up there. She gave her I traffic. feel like you have you fear real feelings, and so you have to just kind of label things aggressively, like label them as funny. Or I have a dark sense of humor. Well, that's true. But I've known you for a long time, so I think it's just this kind of thing of like, here's how I am going to touch on this and like and dispel the power that sadness has. That's that's a really. Really, probably a true point, Karen. But it doesn't change the fact that this fucking video is really darkly funny. Because she's up there, she's giving a fucking traffic report, and all of a sudden she just kind of screams. She goes, no, hit the water, hit the water. Because she's, she's in a helicopter and they're above the bay or something. And uh, Yeah, they went into the river. Yeah, and then they, uh, and they did hit the river. And uh, and, then, she, and as, then there's a silence, and there's a silence, and the DJ goes, "Well, we seem to have said some tough technical difficulties. Like oh. we're not sure what's going on here." Well, she started as the traffic reporter on KFRC in San Francisco. That's how I knew her. And she, there was a morning show called Doctor Donald D Rose in the morning, and this guy was like a classic morning DJ, but he yeah. actually was legitimately funny and weird, and we loved listening to him on the way to school. And so we all, all every carpool mom would let us listen to Dr. Don yeah. and it would just be like, he just had dumb names for the different cities around the Bay area. So it'd be like this, you know, 80 degrees in Berserkly and 50 degrees in San Pani Jose. It this was sounds all that like stuff. it might not literally legitimately have been funny. This might've just been funny. It was you. carpool funny, okay, yeah. but it was like fun. Yeah. And like, you know, it wasn't like these days where it's like, yeah, you know, it was like, it was like, Howard light. Stern it was light. has changed the morning zoo game. Exactly. Now everything, everyone has to be dark, but Jane Dornacker would come in to do the traffic report and, and, legitimately crack up Donald Dr. Don and everyone in the room and it was so 
eye-openingly, empoweringly amazing to me because it was a girl who was fucking getting the mic and destroying every morning. And it just filled me with like, that's what I want to do. Like as like a seven-year-old, I was like, I want to be like that. I want to be able to do that. Because she wasn't, it was just, she was funny. She was just doing the traffic, but it was just kind of the way she was. She just had like a cool style. And apparently the people that knew her from stand-up said that she, anytime she would do a set, she just like would destroy above anybody else. Else. She was just kind of like the funniest. Why one. didn't she become bigger? Uh, I think she went into traffic reporting in San Francisco and then like got promoted to the big, big time in New York. Yeah. And then, you know, so she hit the water and then she survived too. Uh, no, I yeah, thought was, she died. She died in that wreck, but she apparently like, it was one of the things I don't think she died on impact. I think oh, it was like, fuck that's, uh, I'm not hundred percent about that. You know that the shuttle astronauts survived the explosion. Are you serious? And yeah, then they drown? Uh, no, clearly they. So what happened was they go up, it explodes. The the unit itself was co. You know, was because there are switches that were flipped by the pilot, which could only be done by human, not on impact. So it's clear they survived long enough. He's basically, I think, trying to steer it, but there's nothing to be steered. And then it just hit the water at an incredibly high speed, and they all died. Yeah. Better that though than to like the idea, you know, in like you know action movies or whatever, when people are in a car and drowning. Yeah, that's the worst. I have a hammer in my car. <laughs> Do you hammer in the morning? No, because it's like that's one of my weird neurotic. And maybe oh, by the way, it's probably a dream that's not about the literally worried about drowning, but it's uh, I dream that I'm driving and I end up in the water. You know? Yep. Yeah. And so I have a hammer because they sell this. You know, thing water on, is emotions. When you uh, in dream dream symbolism is it really it's it's emotion. So if the wa if the water is like churned up and really you know like it just reflects your inner emo emotional. State. So if you are driving along all of a sudden you go through a bridge and then you're in the water that's like I guess I'm trapped by emotions. Yeah. Well, thank God I bought a real hammer so I can <laughs> hammer. <laughs> if hammer you can only bring it into your dream because when you're halfway you know when you're uh, only halfway submerged you can't open the door. But, but yes, in that's what in those movies when they're like, okay, are you ready? I'm going to open the door or roll down the window. It's like bullshit. The second you crack that thing, you're it's out of control. It's water yeah. and water pressure. Yeah. So you got to hammer that fucking window and then swim out and then go if yeah. you can and then hammer the well, sharks. Now you made me feel a lot less good about having this uh, window hammer, which good. I have. Great. That's all I want. Perfect. So yeah, poor Jane Dornacker. And then they found out that the station was just using like cheap helicopter parts. Oh God. And yeah, to the die on the part, air is so fucked. The sad part, too, is her husband had died briefly shortly before that, so her poor little girl was widowed. No. Yeah. You mean orphaned? Yeah, sorry. You're right. I'm so <laughs> stupid. That's yeah. terrible. What did the husband die of? Uh, I think it was cancer. Fuck. You know, but then I was like, I wonder if the daughter was hot. Is that really what you thought? Yeah. How old was that child? Well, that's what I was trying to do the math on it, and I think she would be like five years older than me, so I'm like, yeah, probably not that, you know. Hot now, not hot at the time. No, not at the time. I meant hot later. It's, that's what it sounded like. No, no, no. I'm mean, hot. Like, I wonder if she's hot now because obviously going through a trauma, vulnerable. Right. Could definitely have, could, she might have a thumb ring or two. Yeah. And just, you know, like in my experience, the girls that have liked me have gone through something, <laughs> something <laughs> not good. Haven't we all been through something though? Well, really? apparently not enough, you know, <laughs> uh, but yes, apparently we all have. So you, uh, yeah, so you would watch Little House yeah. with your now old your sister, older or younger? Two years older. Were you guys close? That's yeah, we fought a Irish lot twins. when we were young. Yeah, Irish twins. Because I think it's like technically 18 months. We fought a lot when we were younger. That's very close. Jesus. Yeah. And then like we would we were total latchkey children. So we would get into fights after school sometimes that would be like drawing blood. We oh, kick, wow. kicked holes in doors like oh, crazy. Yeah. My brother and I, same thing. Yeah. Um, but then when we went to college, because she went to the JC for two years and then we both went to Sac State the same year and suddenly she was liked me and wanted to be friends. So it's like she went through her kind of dark m morose period in high school where I was like, hey, let's hang out. She's Did like, you guys ever me. date the same guys or were you guys interested in the same guys? Because no. I had friends that were I had this friend, Brandon, his sister was two years younger than us. And what we realized around sophomore year is his sister was incredibly pretty. <laughs> and it just kind of, oh, okay. Whoa. And there was a guy, Mike Jennings, who was really good looking and fucked every girl in school. And then what happens to those guys, by the time they get senior year, they've run out of girls. So they're like freshmen, sophomores. Sure. So one day Mike called the house, Brandon was telling the story, 
And he goes, hey, Mike, what's going on? They chatted for a second. He goes, can I talk to your sister? And he was like, oh, no. She's getting called up to the bigs. Yeah, I call, she's getting promoted. Yeah. And it made it a little awkward. Yeah. You know, but if it's two sisters, I would have to imagine. Well, no, we were... Um our school, I went to a school that only had 350 kids. So you... How big was your fucking town? Uh, Petaluma was like... When oh, I was Petaluma. growing up... Yeah. It's so really, like it's Polly Kloss. Small. Yes. And referenced in... Uh, before Polly Kloss, it was referenced in a Peanuts. Yes, because... Um, Snoopy or Spike ran away to Petaluma? Or what to was Petaluma, because Charles yeah. Schultz lived in Santa Rosa, which was the biggest town next uh, north. Oh, I didn't know he lived that up. Oh. Yeah, there's a... My niece that now takes ice skating lessons at the Charles Schultz peanut skating rink. He was big time on ice skating. You like that? Yeah. 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 Did, did anybody ever meet Charles Schultz? No. I used to golf at a course. Like, we used to sneak on at, at Carnegie Mellon. We'd walk on the ninth green because we bribe the groundskeeper with beer to get to golf for free. It was a terrible course. But <laughs> was Bill Murray the groundskeeper? <laughs> no, it was, it was some old guy named Vince and we brought him like a case of skunked beer and we, th- we didn't see him for a couple days. We thought we'd killed him. And he Aww. goes, that beer was incredible. We're like, great. <laughs> Perfect. But uh, Mr. Rogers lived in the uh, apartment at the top and it was like, it's like Charles Schultz Mr. Rogers, even Hulk Hogan, they're like religious figures because you knew them when you were a child, you know? Yes. But I would say they're beyond irony. Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan is beyond irony. No, true. Uh, Although I did, uh, I was working on something, I can't remember what it was, and uh, it was some bit, and I made this this uh parallel which i was so proud of and made me so happy which was a picture of hulk hogan like the famous picture from the 80s where it's a blue background and he's wearing his red and uh yellow yeah it's torn up shirt his hulkamania and, hulkamania yeah. and uh i brought that up and then i brought up a pack a package of oscar meyer wieners and they look exactly the same because his skin is hot dog color absolutely probably the same amount of nitrates in there too same, same nitrates same amount of racism and then just the same color okay scheme. first of all i mean i did a, a a lab in college and it was like this lab smells delicious <laughs> and they were like oh it's the nitrates it's the hot dogs i'm like oh, oh it makes a lot yeah of sense. uh whole so nitrates not a race. smell like that yeah, it's not the hot dogs no hot dogs the smell of hot dogs or is nitrate cheap hot dogs smells like nitrates okay uh, Hulk Hogan is not a racist. I don't care what you say. Okay. He's a great, I don't great care. Man. <laughs> I don't know. I just know what I've skimmed. I, I feel strongly that like I'm a pro Hulk Hogan. Also, I'm from Florida. Right. Oh, right. So you wouldn't know the difference anyway. So Petaluma, did with the Polly Kloss thing was happening, were you out or were you still there? I was in San Francisco starting stand-up. I will admit that made me laugh too. Not the rape and murder <laughs> of the girl. Not that. It was that the judge gave him last words. And then it was like, what do you expect? What do you expect? Did he say fuck you? He said to the fucking father, he goes, her last words were, don't do me like my daddy did. And it was like, oh, that whole thing. Like Petaluma was this tiny town. Yeah. Uh, it Now it's kind of like. How small was it? Like 30,000 okay. people or so. And now it's kind of like rich people from the city who can afford. Because it's all San these Francisco Victorian has, houses yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it's like grown out. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the time it was just dairy. It was just country people. Yeah. And, uh, so something like that happening there was just like literally no one locked their doors type of town. It's like everything, really? every, it's what you see on forensic files all the time where people are like around here, that stuff doesn't happen, but it really never happened. And the one time, uh, my mom used to love to tell the story. The one time anything big ever really happened in that town, like in the seventies and eighties when I was growing up. A lady got her purse stolen. A guy tried to snatch her purse and run up the street. And everyone on the street chased him and tackled him. Really? <laughs> it was that, it's that kind of town. It's just like, nope. There's well, you know, that happened in Los Angeles, too. Uh, with that's how the, with the Night Stalker. Exactly. It's that's my how he was favorite, caught. That's my favorite thing of all time. What, that the East L.A. The yeah, they were like, go fuck yourself. Like, because he was, the, the fact that he was there and some people, it was like word was out that like he's in our neighborhood. Yeah. And then they spotted him on that bus and those people got together and beat the shit out yes. of that guy that's a beautiful thing it is a beautiful thing it's you know it's funny you uh you like physical violence i love it more than uh most women that i would say although that's not entirely true you view it as a sign of protection which i'll say is uh i've certainly dated girls like that i like it when people aren't apathetic 
And when, and I, these days, everyone, it makes sense to me. Like we, you and I were talking and it's like, nobody wants to get sued. Nobody wants to get shot, especially in Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, Nobody wants to get shot. Nobody wants to have to have to confront the one person who like you look in their eyes and you're like, oh, I am a dead person. Of course that makes sense. But w- I think w- the society we live in these days, people are so to themselves. It's like, well, that's somebody else's problem. See, so, you view, the, here's the thing you view. It, it's so, it's so you view not wanting to fight as like a sign of selfishness. Yeah, but not in every situation. But I have to say, and I already told you this, so stop fucking pointing the finger at me. But I had a father who was happy to fight. He was like, grew up with eight brothers and sisters. He fist fought all the time. It was He's not Irish, a big, big deal. Irish guy. Big yeah. Irish and they were kind of like, gang, you know, in 50s gang style type of people. I mean, they were gang members back in the 50s. It was yeah, just okay. Yeah, when there okay. was like bull whips. Yeah. <laughs> when it was, well, I'll tell you one night when I was like eight and my sister was 10, it was summertime. Our windows were open and I heard someone walking in the tan bark in front of our windows. We lived way out in the country. So like nobody was ever around ever. And we heard footsteps and panting outside our windows. And I was laying in bed. I was frozen in fear. There's a man under my window going, <sighs> It was so scary. And I see my sister because the, the hallway went into like an L shape and my sister's bedroom was at the end of the hall. I see her zip across the hallway, like through past my door jam and into my parents' room. And then I knew it was real because I was like, oh shit. And I run in there too. And my sister's going, daddy, there's someone else in there, whatever. And my dad opens his nightstand drawer, pulls out a switchblade, flicks it open and goes, stay here. And it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It turned out it was a golden retriever. And there was no one for him to stab, but it was that kind of thing of like, he was fucking ready to party. Did he kill the dog anyway? He just stabbed to- that dog and we had it for breakfast. Uh, no, but it's just kind of, I, I understand that that's a, that's a standard that's been set that it kind of can't exist in these days Look, anymore. It's one thing if you got a family there, you got two little girls. Yeah. You come out with the knife. You can flick that thing open. Yeah, absolutely. But, you, but you're right. In the parking lot at Fry's, it's not the same yes, situation. Uh, the story I was telling was that I was uh, dating this girl. We were on and off for a long time beautiful woman and we're we're <laughs> she really was very pretty very smart too uh and we are we're going to find a spot and somebody cuts us off and then i go like three cars down and park and it's not a big deal and then we walk into the fries and then she points the guy out and he's with and she goes that's the asshole that's the asshole that took the parking space and he's <laughs> with his like kid and his wife and he looks me up and down and he was short, and I think he was like, he, you could, she said, I was just like, what the fuck? I go, I'm not going to fucking fight this guy over a space. Fuck, you go fight him. But he looked yeah, me no. up and down, and then I think he had the thought where he goes, I don't want to get beaten up by a nerd. I don't know what this guy's story <laughs> is. He's big. Right. I'm just going to walk away. And he walked away. I'm like, we both walked away from each other. Well, because that's crazy. It's Los Angeles. Then you'd have to be fighting people every day if you were going to fight over parking spots. I know. I know. There's that's some people crazy. that do fight about it. It's crazy. You know, when I, I was little, I was little, my, uh, like a baby, apparently, they told, the doctors told my parents how tall I'd be, which I don't know how they can do that. But my mom said, he'll be a freak. And my dad said, he'll put up with less shit. And they were both right. Yeah. That's so right. So that, that got me out of a jam. But uh, yeah, it's sometimes girls want you to fight to prove something. And it's like, I got nothing to prove here. And that's your fault for dating. It's a stupid whore. <sighs> she wasn't a stupid whore. <laughs> no. She was very sweet. Her, her dad, her dad loved And it. she was beautiful. Let's not forget yeah, that part. Let's, that's, let's not forget that. Let's she, not forget the most important part. Uh, well, yeah, it was, it was important. But, uh, you know, I didn't stay with her for nine years because she was beautiful. Although that didn't hurt. It was like, you just find the right person. You're like, I guess we're just going to keep breaking up 50 times. Yes. Oh, I've done that. Really? Have you? Oh, yeah. 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 There's two types of people. There's the get the people that think that's crazy. And my parents were married to each other three times. Is that true? True. Yes. So your dad was married a total of six? Total of five times. Yes. Wow. Twice before my mother. And then, but he never had kids with either of those women. And then uh, when he had ki- you know kids with her, I was the first. And he's like, I guess I'm stuck. <laughs> and then that was, you know. That's fiery to, to divorce and remarry. Yeah. This, I learned the meaning of the word pathetic and pathological from my mom described my father. Mm-hmm. So like I would confuse those two words because she would say both about him, but then I and learned- And they both start with path. Yeah, exactly. It's really confusing. Yeah, that's true. So, Which, what does your mom do for a living? English teacher. Oh, so vocabulary. Yeah, learned a lot of vocabulary. <laughs> it, was, it was really forced on me. Uh, she just quit like this year. Mm. Like this, I think it's her first or second week without teaching. What, did, what grade did she teach? She taught like high school mostly, but then middle school. 
they kept moving around because when you're old and you're in Orange County, they just want to move your ass around for no reason. Yeah. Uh, I, my sister's a teacher. Oh, really? What'd she teach? She teaches um, like K through, usually K through three, I think. That's kind of a different thing, but still it's like teaching's not fun. It's not fun. She totally makes nothing. Does and she live she, in, and still live in Petaluma? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and she teaches in Novato and she's been doing it now for like 25 years. But the funny, it's just weird because she is really, really good at it. She's won all kinds of awards and, you know, whatever. And she's really good at teaching kids how to be at school. You know, like that's kind of why she teaches kindergarten because she's really kind of strict, but like, yeah, really, at she's that just point, good you're trying at it. to yeah, socialize them. You're socializing them and you're, te- you're teaching them like how to, how to follow rules, how to help other people, like what you're actually supposed to act like when you're in this room, when your mom's not there. Uh, so it's kind of good. Is she but married? Does she have children? She is not married anymore. Um, but she has my niece, Nora, who's eight. Do you guys get along? Oh yeah. And yeah, you yeah. like the niece? I love her. She's my favorite person. Did you ever want to have kids? No, I really didn't. Good for you. You were married. I was married briefly. How was that? It's very Without strange. Without getting into too much detail. It, you know what it was? It when, It was when I worked at Ellen and my life was really hellish working there. The job was insanely stressful. And my mom had just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and everything in my life was felt like it was like breaking apart. How old were you when you got, and that's when you, you just married the guy? Um, I, at the time, I think I was 30 two or yeah, something like that. That's a real marriage age. It's a marriage age because you were have supposed to have done it five years previous. And because my whole life had been she's the black sheep, look what look what Karen's doing. Oh, she's doing that. And like and coming from such a traditional Irish Catholic family, I was truly the only girl that wasn't married. My aunts would always talk about if their daughter wasn't married by like twenty six, it was really problematic. They'd get real panicky. Like it, they're very old school. That still happens? It does in my family. That's and really... Vi- uh, I think only one of my cousins has been divorced. Yeah. It's like it's like old old school. In Ireland, isn't divorce illegal? Or did they finally legalize it? That Abortion's was like Abortion's illegal. I don't know about divorce. Divorce was illegal for a while there. I believe it. Did you see the Magdalene sisters? No. Oh, if you like fucked up stories to laugh at, that is the most fucked up. Basically, in Ireland, there used to be these like nunnery slash workhouses they they would send rape victims and uh girls I'm already who got, smiling. Uh, already you, smiling you're already loving it rape victims girls who got knocked up uh and and maybe you know, girls who like people. broke the law all the sinner girls and they would have to go to these workhouses called the magdalene sisters houses and they were ritually abused there for years it's the craziest story and they just closed them in like 1978 like this you you're watching the you're watching this movie and you're like oh my god this is beyond fucked every this is so crazy this is so crazy and then at the end when they they bring up those like true life cards of like yeah. this this woman actually went here and she's the one that wrote the movie or whatever then one of the things like the last magdalene sisters house closed and whatever year it was where like i couldn't stop getting chills of like oh this has been fine for years they were just throwing those people away they weren't just throwing them away. They were like, it was like slave labor because they would do laundry. Like, oh, wow. It's cr- the crazy. You have to watch it. It's a really, really good movie, but it's very upsetting. So do you have any, do you feel any link to Ireland? Do you? Uh... I do. I mean, I do. Because my grandparents were both straight over. They really? were. It, I'm second generation Irish. So they, they had the Irish accents and everything, which oh, yeah, always yeah. sounds to me like a put on. Whenever you're an Irish accent yep. or a New Orleans accent yep. on TV, I'm like, nobody talks Fake. like that. You know why? Because Irish sounds kind of like singing. Like, it's like, oh, how are you doing today? Yeah, it's like, it's, enough with this yeah, shit. It sounds, um, it's kind of that, also, it's like Australian where it sounds really up, like no matter what they're saying. It's yeah. like, oh, do you come over here and they give you a smack on the face? It all sounds nice. Yeah. And like, fun. in fact, in Back to the Future 3, Marty McFly's <laughs> great, great you know, ancestors were like, just giving Michael J. Fox a chance to do an Irish version of himself. Is that, I can't remember that movie. Uh, it's a, well, actually, no. Back to Future 1 is incredible. Back to Future 2 is execrable. And Back to Future 3 <laughs> is kind of in the middle. Okay. Isn't it, is Back to Future 3 the one with the cowboy stuff? Yes. Okay. Where he's Clint Eastwood and he like, the, the, it's exciting. It's on a train. I mean, it's, it's a great franchise. They did, they did everything perfectly in that first movie. Yeah, they, it's, it's so good. The first one's so good that it's, you give them the next two because they deserve it. They deserved all that money because the first one was so brilliant. 100%. I just rewatched it 
maybe two years ago and it 100 percent holds up oh uh, i've watched one like 40 50 times because we got it on tape like at mcdonald's in college <laughs> we had that in the sound of music and we watched both of those repeatedly constantly yeah well sound of music that's kind of sweet yeah look <laughs> i'm not only laughing at like bad things but it's like some of those things there's nice things too well yeah i mean like when i was like seven or eight my mom told me the plot of of mice and men you know, she mm -hmm. explained to me and she goes and then he breaks the woman's neck you know the pun and then we laughed we both laughed about it <laughs> it was like yeah it's like a funny thing yeah so yeah that's uh maybe it's something in the in the family maybe well also it is crazy like this life we are all living is crazy it it's is true. chaos yeah. and so it's insane but i'm surprised that you did such the typical the cliche like i'm 32 i'm gonna get married now it wasn't that we had been dating for three years and he asked me uh, uh, it was a surprise karen you knew he was gonna ask you i swear to god i didn't know it was christmas <laughs> eve I knew, oh, I knew like yeah, three Christmas minutes Eve before, proposal? Oh, but I'm telling you, we literally never talked about marriage until he asked me to marry okay. him. We never had one conversation about it ever. I swear to God. It was, I, it was know, crazy. I envy that relationship. It was pretty great. I mean, yeah. like it worked in some ways, but it, uh, but it also didn't work at all for me, but everything else was so awful that I needed to have somebody. So he proposed and you, were you excited and happy? Um, I wanted to say no, and I didn't think I could. Did he do it in public? Yeah, and how, he did. It, he had public? already talked to my parents. Like I, as he was going down on one knee, I realized every you have to say yes. Everybody knows this is about to happen. Like the parents are waiting. This is just basically like this is a foregone conclusion. And you can't fuck this up. Is how I felt about it. Wow, he gave you the fetichome plea. He did. Yeah, uh, and and so did you think about saying no later, or were you just kind of like, well? I no, uh, no. My dad, who was married five times, told me something interesting. I said, Dad, when did you know that the marriages were going to go bad? He said, in every single instance, it was before the marriage, before yes. the wedding. Yes. And I go, you just do it anyway. He goes, yeah, you figure. Well, you just kind of like, yeah. I think I wanted to, I wanted to give my mom, I mean, this is ridiculous thinking in retrospect, but my mom was halfway through her Alzheimer's journey. And so she was still aware enough to like know what That's was going almost, on. Dude, that'd be the cruelest time. Well, I think it was my, th my no, thinking. No, not to Mary, I'm saying for her, it's the cruelest part. Like when you, you have Alzheimer's and you oh, know it's it awful. and you're watching She's yourself. In a, constant panic like she's there and then gone and comes back and, and then just, uh, it, it was torturous um so i kind of it was like wanting to give her one little thing before she was finally gone yeah uh which is not how you do permanent relationships like as much as i understand now like as much as that's a lovely concept it's completely unrelated it's like what they say about suicide it's a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem <laughs> yes exactly exactly and also i think i felt like no one had ever asked me before who was i to say no it was like a lot of that heavy shit of my insecurity and my like oh it doesn't matter what you want because if somebody wants you you're lucky to be wanted type of shit it was it was bad stuff um it's you know i would say it's a bad foundation for a marriage but there's no good one there's no such thing as a good foundation for a marriage i haven't heard of very many i i you know that's the thing that's why everybody's parents are always fucked up it's like because that's that's the way it has to be well and ironically and i think it's because my dad was very patient my mom was very uh you know when she was healthy she was very outspoken and she was very like you know she had two terrible alcoholic parents so she was very like mistrustful and she had all these issues and my dad just was kind of like i picked you and we're doing this type of thing and that he that was gave the, her he a was lot the of, rock yeah he was the rock and their marriage she she constantly told us how great my dad was and how lucky she was and how lucky we all were you know my mom said about my dad she said well i'll say this about him he never beat me <laughs> That was like the nicest thing. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I, okay. It was a weird, you know that, their yeah. relationship was weird because they got married and she wasn't that into it, she said, but then they didn't get married and then she was into it. Then she had me and then I think they talked about getting divorced but then she had my brother 
And then they did get divorced. And, but it's, I don't know exactly when, cause it's very, when it's off and on like that, you're just kind of vague. And then they, they got back together. Who knows why the fuck they did that? And they remarried. And then that was a whole thing. And I, that might've been a year or two, might've been five. I have no idea. And then he went away again. And then he came back in high school. Cause my brother and I were like grown. Yeah. And she used to whip us. But then at some point it stopped working because yep. we were too big. Yeah. So then dad was around and then, so he was there like after I left high school and then he, just for the next 20 years until he died. Uh, and she was telling me when I came back that, that she used to have to tell him, get angry at Matthew, get angry. Cause like, <laughs> you know, and he just didn't want to do it because he never would get angry. Why? Because he felt bad. I think he, it was the craziest thing. Cause I know I am incredibly good at getting people upset and my mom is way better. <laughs> And, and that's the thing that's shocking is he shot a family dog, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So I know he had it in him, but he never once got, I saw him get angry once. Wow. And I was like, it was incredible. But do you know why? I mean, do you think you know why? I think he just wasn't an angry person. Hmm. Like, it was like, I guess I don't, I, it, it was a kind of a mystery. So like, uh, yeah, but at least... So when he, the old man started to get sick, I mean, a bad heart and cancer, but, and then he started to get a little squirrely with, I think whatever he had, his mother had Alzheimer's and it was clear that he was heading down that path. Yeah. He would call constantly. Yeah. Constantly. And he'd be like, your mother's going to kick me out. She's Aww. like, no, I'm not. She always was threatening, but you know, <laughs> and then there, but there at the end, it was like a nightmare, but, but then she misses him now that he's gone because he's always around. Of course. You say, of course, but I would not have expected that. That well, was a surpriser. But, but I mean, I did mine and my ex's relationship was not great at all. And I miss him all the time because you get this, it's a familiarity and there's a kind of like, uh, an adaptation to what, to having something. I mean, it really is you, it's like you kind of bond with that person. So even if there's problems or whatever, you, it's like the bond that you miss. Imagine if you had kids with them. <laughs> I, I knew that was a major problem when the first time someone said, when are you gonna, guys going to have kids? And I made a face. <laughs> and then I was like, this isn't good. Like, I have made a bad decision. Well, did, was that, did you make the face because you didn't want kids or because you didn't want kids with that I didn't want kids guy? with him. With him? Right. Did he know that? I, he, we never talked about anything. It like, sounds, it here's the thing. He didn't mention anything about marriage and you were surprised by a proposal. I was. You guys never discussed children. It sounds like I'm going to go on a limb and say there might've been communications issues. In the we relationship. had such intense communication issues. And one of the things was, and I knew this like six months in, he was completely a non-communicator. He didn't, we would sit at the dinner table at night in total silence. And that for me was torture because my family was like, blah, 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 24 seven. My mother was a psychiatric nurse. My father was an old Irishman that had 1000 stories to tell. There was never, there was never quiet. And so sitting in that relationship in the silence, I was miserable, but I, took it as he doesn't want to talk to me. And so I have to do something to be better or more. It was a terrible fuck. It played on every insecurity that I had. It was, it was torturous. That's my mom said when she met my dad, she said, I, David, she goes, David, I used to think still waters ran deep. <laughs> then I realized, no, there's sometimes they're just still. Yeah. How'd you true. guys get it introduced? We work together. How did you guys end up fucking is the real question. Um, I thought he was cute. Well, there we go. That's funny. That that like that's what it comes down to. I thought he was cute, and I felt so unattractive at that show because every day, I you know I was Weren't like, "Were you the fucking boss?" Yeah. So I was miserable. I was never not drinking coffee. I was never never didn't have a handful of peanut M and M's, M &Ms in my hand. I was so far away from like when I was trying to be camera ready and a, you know a performer and a comedian i had just kind of like i'm behind the scenes and i don't have to worry about that anymore and part of letting go in that way made me think well i'm no one's ever going to want to date me so when this like hot guy from some other department like was you know, he a legitimate hot guy yeah he's really good looking yeah he's really cute and so he when he was into you yeah. and you're like this is awesome yeah i was like i 
you know, it's, it's the terrible thing about having low self-esteem is that when things like that happen to you, instead of being like, well, do I want this relationship? Is this the person that's good for me? You're just like, Oh fucking thank God. Because no one, no one was coming to my door. You know what I mean? No one was showing up at the NBC. Surely lot. there were some ugly guys who had been into it. No, that, that's the problem with my personality is that I think I'm in a very intimidating type of woman that even if people have been into it, they would never try because they think I would like rip them a new one or just be in mean. In fairness, you have been known to be mean. I am mean. Yeah. So then when you say they think, it's more like they know. Well, but it's not actually always true. It's not always not true. Not always true. It's like, just, yeah, sometimes if I you're will. dumb or boring, I'll be mean to you. Karen. I was, when was I mean to you? Uh... Actually, no, you were never mean to me. That's the thing. That was, you were always very, very nice. Because I liked you because you were smart. And when we talked to each other, you had things to say. And we would engage each other as two equals. That was shocking to me. There was, was lots when of people I that aren't like Angeles, that. When I came to Los Angeles, you know, I was, yeah, we met, like, I was not that, I was relatively new. And you were always very, very nice. And I found that weird. Well, that's your problem. Yeah, maybe that's my insecurity. <laughs> but also, I... I understand why I, w- I had that reputation. And absolutely, I just had no patience for idiots. That's what it was. That's what it was. You know, here's the thing. I have, uh, you know, I say the same thing too, but you have to accept that you know who says that? Assholes. <laughs> well, when and you're like, ultimately, it's the, the, there's two groups of people in the world. There's idiots and there's assholes. I guess that's true. And it's, I'm fine being on the asshole but side. You're like, you know, yeah, but the problem is it's everybody else's problem. That's why. Y- yeah. And you keep saying that until you're like alone in a room and you're like, no one's ever going to love me. And so then, then, you're then just let's marry that guy. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, and he was really funny. He was very, very funny. Okay. Now, was he funny? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or was he just attractive? No, no, no. He was, he's legitimately funny. Cause I dated the girl I dated who was very pretty and very smart would always be like, you don't think I'm pretty. You don't think I'm smart. You don't think I'm funny. I'd say, I think you're very smart and very pretty. And I just leave it at that. No, this guy made me genuinely laugh. I think that's the other thing too, is because uh, I won't lump you into this, but for me, comedy is like, being funny is like being good looking to me for, for that, that if you're not funny, that's ugly to me is what I'm saying. What's the part about, I won't lump you into this. Well, I'm just saying it. That's, I was about to say we as comics, but I, but then I realized it might not be true for you. Oh yeah. I don't care. Well, I don't care about you either. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't care about if somebody's funny. Right. Okay. So then I was right to say I won't lump you in because yeah, it would have been sorry, a- yeah. in inaccurate. Fact, in my experience, it's like that's a very man-woman split, although not even there are plenty of women that don't care. But like none of my male friends are like, oh, I enjoy being around her. She's funny. Now, yeah. they will say smart or cool. If you're smart, you say she's smart because you're excited that a girl's smart. And if you're not, you say she's cool because... She makes you feel smart, I guess. I'm right. not sure exactly, but like funny never gets brought up. But so you found this good looking guy who's funny. That sounds perfect to me. I know. But the problem is that. The problem is that he couldn't communicate anything and he didn't, he couldn't talk. It, there was a lot of problems. So how old your mother when she starts getting Alzheimer's? 60. She was like 66 or 67. So your mother's kind of old. It was, she, well, now. Now, I mean. But, it was early onset. So actually, no, sorry, that would be inaccurate because she's had it for 10 years. So How old is she now? Uh, uh, she's now 74. So she got it when she was like 63. Wow, my mom is 73. I cannot imagine what that's like. It's horrible. My mom, my mother's mother started to get a little squirrely when she, you know, people get old, that happens. I mean, she was started to get old, you know, it was, I don't know if it's Alzheimer's, but I think it was essentially. She lost her mind the last year or two. And my yeah. mother was hurt because my grandmother became an asshole. Like right. Her personality fundamentally changed. Yes. And it was like surprising to her. Yeah. Yeah. My, my moms did too. And the real problem was, uh, first of all, my mom's mom got Alzheimer's and she lived with us. So we knew what was coming down the pipe. It was like a- Wait, you lived with a woman with Alzheimer's for how long? Um, it was uh, like three years until she had to be put in a How home. How old were you? 
I was seven, I think, oh, seven, so eight, real nine. formative. Re- very formative, very upsetting to watch someone go from like the fun grandma that would play old maid with you and, you know, sing songs and be fun times to like sh- babbling and didn't know where she was. Very, Oof. very upsetting. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, going to see her in a convalescent home, which is a really awful. Hers was awful terrible place i mean the whole thing was awful so when my mom got diagnosed like we all knew it was happening because she started repeating herself a lot and kind of doing weird things and this isn't just some old woman this is your mother this is my fucking mother who was a psychiatric nurse who was the bottom line here's here's reality let me tell you how it is right now and i know this from a psychological standpoint and i know this from you know because i'm a woman of the world standpoint so yeah it was very very upsetting and she became like she wouldn't leave the house and we'd be like ma you got to go like maybe go volunteer or something because she was retired at that point and she'd be like i'm gonna i'm gonna go i'm gonna volunteer down it and she always had this plan and she would never do it and then it was like then she wouldn't take her nightgown off and eventually it was just eventually it was she clearly has this disease fully and she does not know where she fucking is and she would click into and out of it. So it was horrifying. That's what, yeah, like the, the sundown thing. Yeah. Where they get real agitated when it nighttime comes. Cause I had a know. friend who was schizophrenic. He oh. moved out here with me and we didn't know what was happening. And, uh, and it was like, you didn't really know, but he moved out here with me. And then, the the mo- the worst part was he would do this crazy shit and then we'd both laugh about the crazy shit and he right. would know he's doing crazy shit and he couldn't help himself right and you're watching him just go down a hole yeah and it got worse and worse and I just kind of like washed my hands of it because I just didn't know what to do didn't deal with it and then he moved away and killed himself uh. but it was like the t- most terrifying thing was he would seem normal enough so he, I remember telling a story about how he walked to Venice one night and we were in Venice he walked to like to Lincoln he said you know, there are people who live in the bushes, oh. you know, homeless people. And I'm like, oh, okay. I just assumed yeah, because yeah. They, they would talk to him. And it wasn't until years later, I'm like, oh, those weren't actual homeless people. That was auditory hallucinations. But it took me a while to realize because he seemed normal some of the yeah, time. Yeah, and how are you supposed to fucking know what only really a psychologist or psychiatrist yeah. knows? Like, you're a kid, and that's the age. Like, you're like, yeah, we're all being badasses and moving to LA, and everyone's going to do what they want. Like, yeah. you're not you're not immediately supposed to turn into someone's nurse or doctor and be like, well, here's how we're going to take care of you. Yeah. It was, I just had no idea. So that I just not. didn't know what the, I know and that what's dude. scarier than mental illness. It's yeah. fucking, it's like someone turning into, it's basically what like zombie movies are about. It's it, like someone turning. What's weird too is so subtle is like, I knew it since fourth grade. It was like everything about his personality just taken up a tick. Yeah. So people go crazy. That's the thing. Now there's a guy at the store who is schizophrenic. And people torture him. I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, that's terrible. Uh, and uh, and people are like, why, why, David? You're such a bad person. And then it's because I guess it's you know it's when you meet crazy homeless people, it's easy to see them as only crazy homeless people. Just like your grandmother, even though you knew her a little, it's like it's just an old woman. But when you see the shift, that's what's so terrifying. When you see what they were and then what they are. Well, I mean. And that that could happen to anybody. Technically, it could happen to anybody. Yeah. The idea that anybody would torture a schizophrenic person, that person's a sociopath. So watch your fucking back. Because there are lots of them at the store. Yeah, well, that, of that course is, that there is are. an absolute tell. I've, I've like, it's uh, not, not a good sign because yeah. that's basically like going to kick someone in the face that only has one leg. Like, what the fuck is wrong yeah, with you? Yeah, they're like, oh, he loves it. I'm like, that's his illness. Yeah. <laughs> like, but I mean, the thing that's upsetting is to me, too when like the sicker she got the less she could mask things so her whole thing was always looking at my dad and going okay let's go home like she didn't want to be around me and my sister she just wanted to leave with my dad all the time so you felt oh that's interesting like yeah that's funny because i guess that was the thing with my mom and my grandmother was maybe she thought was he was she always thinking this yes right and then this is gonna be sad i probably will start crying a little bit but go for it at one point way way late in the game when it was bad my sister was putting her to bed and my mom looked up and was there like my mom and said you do know i love you both and like my sister said and this is fucking second hand but the idea that she that's why that disease is so evil she clicked back in it was like old 80s mom came back grabbed my sister's arm and says you do know i love you and it was like thank fucking god that we got that message because everything she was 
so hard to be around and so like whiny, which she never was like, she was the most together badass mom that was cool, literally just a cool. She was very Joan Holloway, my mom. She was always just like, "Oh, really? All right, let's go." And like all the other moms loved my mom and she was really popular. And she turned into this sour, naggy weirdo that wouldn't listen to anything anyone said and was insecure. And was, I guess so, but also kind of like just wasn't into us, you know, like was just like always looking at my dad going, I think it's time to go home. At least she was still into your dad. She was till the very end. She one time looked at my sister. My dad walked into the kitchen. She looked at my sister and goes, who's that? Like st- attracted to him deeply. Yeah. It's a fucked up disease. Yeah. No, so she is still alive. She's still alive, but she's like, now she looks like a sad baby bird like she her eyes aren't open and her arms are all you know like it's her brain is completely swiss cheese yeah that's the worst so and she's just laying coming. there but she's actually on um hospice she's on like the hospice is basically taking care of her so that she's she will die. yeah like my dad was like he got cancer so he kept losing weight <laughs> and losing and losing and then it, you'd see him and you're like jesus man you got thin and then you get used to it but the last time i went to see him there was no getting used to it no he was like a hundred six four and like a hundred pounds and you're like this Did he look like jesus like no beyond he looked like an insect <sighs> he like you could see every bone in him yeah and even thinking about it now i'm like i don't want to have that image in my head but I, I was i was sent i was it was like we knew he was gonna die so we were you know i, I knew it and my brother knew it and i'm like i'm gonna go home you know, I told him, I'm bidding on a ticket. He, the old man's finally going to go. And so then it was like, I was the ambassador. So then even then, like mom was like, I can't be, I'm going, I'm going home. I go, I'm sleeping here. Cause I figured I don't want somebody else to call yeah. mom and say, dad's dead. But it was like, you're dealing at that point, the late stage hospice. And it's interesting. All the nurses have seen it all. So they can tell you exactly what's happening. They're like, oh, he's got like three days. Yeah. I mean, it was unpredictable. The doctor thought maybe it would be a couple of weeks, but then at some point it was like very clear he's actively dying. Yes. And then he started making sounds and like, you know, weird shit. And then you're like, oh, I guess this is it. And then, then it's just sleep. And then he was just done. Yeah. But towards the end, the weird thing was that the brain stuff was weird because he got very insecure and needy. And it wasn't like he would, it was just odd because he was always very, almost mysterious, very silent. And all of a sudden he's calling me a lot. And it's like, I didn't take all those calls. I felt bad about that. But well, it's, cause it's still your dad. You know yeah. what I mean? Like he's still in the place that, he's still in dad place just cause he's sick. Well, it's weird. It's like, he was never like a dad, dad. Like, right, right. And he was more like an older brother. He was around. <laughs> it was like, when I would come home, he'd be like grumbling about my mom and my brother. Like we were like, you know, we knew. But I guess what I mean is you're not going to take a call from a person who was in this one position and is now being completely different yeah. because how scary is that? It's like, yeah. you don't even know who that person is. I was talking to my brother about this because it would be like, this would be every call be this. Uh, I was dad. No, no, she's not kicking you out. Dad. She's not kicking you out. She's uh, not kicking you out. Dad, just lay down. Trust me. Call me tomorrow morning. I promise you I'll answer. I will answer this time. She's not kicking you out. And then I said, is that how you talk to dad? And Matthew goes, no, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not it at all. But it, what, he doesn't, he didn't talk to your brother about that. It was weird. It was like, I think because it's, there's a big difference. It was like a four year difference and the relationship changed with my mom. And it was like, it was like, I saw him as like a young man be, I, in a weird way. He was around for me when he was young and around for my brother when he was old. Oh, oh yeah. So when I'd come home, he would be saying, your brother's calling me a toady because he was just there at my mom's bidding, you know, and then my mom would say, your brother's calling him a toady. And then she'd laugh. <laughs> and that was, that was my family. And then, uh, yeah, the old man finally died, which was shocking. My first thought was like, I guess their marriage is finally over. <laughs> Wait, so you were in the room. I was there. I was the part that I was, I was in the room cause I had to be, you know, yeah. They said he's dying. I looked and I'm like, yeah, they stopped breathing. But, do you think that experience uh, affected your like outlook on life in any way? I mean, I was 38. I don't know. I'm 39 now. Like this is like recent, uh, you know, yes and no. I mean, one thing I'll tell you is I'll get checked for colon cancer. <laughs> Good. Cause that's my father and my grandfather, you yeah. know, that's in a weird way. 
you know, I guess my father and my grandmother both, uh, you know, had Alzheimer's because my grandmother was definitely fucked up. But I've never really worried about getting it. It's just like, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. But I guess well, colon and it, cancer. It comes down on the mother's side. Does so it really? good news for you and super bad news for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you're genuinely worried about this. I am it every single day. Really? Yeah. So this is like a clock. Now, how old would your That's grandmother? That's why I do so many she... podcasts. I just <laughs> want to live. I want to live. This is a bad reason. <laughs> Before I go, which could be any minute. So you, how old was your grandmother when she got it? She was 70, probably. Your mother was like 60. 65, 64. That is pretty early. Yeah. Did, now, how did you know it was first happening? She would just repeat herself like every three minutes. So she would be like, Karen, I really think you should go, you know, change your pants or whatever. I'm like, I will, mom. I'm just going to do this thing. And then everything would be normal, normal, normal. And then like, it would be like almost to the minute. Karen, I really want you to change those pants. I, said, I already told you. So it, it, when it started, it was like, you just think she's nagging you, being irritating. And that was the other part of like the guilt piece was me and my sister were both really fighty with my mom before so it was we were even fightier with her because she was such a pain in the ass and that she was just so repetitive and she but she she was like she would repeat herself but she also still had her old stance of like but i know everything and so you just wanted to like oh like it would drive you crazy um but then you know after a while it, you could see how she, you could tell she didn't know she'd already said it how long did it take before you realized this is something medical um it was like between visits, say, I would say it would be like five months because like I was home for Christmas and noticed it and didn't say anything. And then when I came back for say Easter or something like that, it was much worse. And I had to sit my dad down and say, she has it. You need to go to the doctor. Stop pretending it's not happening. So he was denying it. Yes. And they went to the doctor yep. and then the doctor said, yep, she's got it. Yep. And did you tell your sister that? Yeah, my sister already knew. I think my sister and I were talking about it. Like but from you were, the beginning. Why were you dispatched to tell dad? I wasn't. <laughs> I just did it because I was staying at the house. Okay. And I was observing what their lives were like compared to six months prior. And but that's a big thing for you to be the one to tell. Yeah. Like I can tell you that would have to be me with my brother and me. It's like, you know. It's like, that's, that's just the role I would have to play. But also I think it was because I was kind of the quote unquote outsider. Like I wasn't, my sister was there every day. Oh, so she yeah. wasn't as, she was as in the denial process as my dad was because they were all scared shitless. It was like, they were all seeing it and pretending together. So I had to come in and go like, what the fuck are you all doing? Yeah. It's funny. Like when I was with my friend, I didn't realize he was doing weird shit, but I was like, I guess this is what he does. But when my friends visited, they're like, he, that dude's weird. I'm like, yeah, I guess he is. Yeah. But also with fucking schizophrenia, it's so awful because they're only weird. It's like, you know, it, it's not, it's cumulative. It's not to, in total. So it's not like his personality changed overnight, right? It'd be like just yeah. little things, drip drops little, here yeah. and there. Yeah, exactly. He had a story where he was like, he this crazy. He left New York, and the story was just beyond insane. It was like he thought he was on fire, so he started screaming "Blood of Christ," and he was in a legal sublet, and he was screaming so much that his his roommate, who never met him, had to tie her clothes into a rope and go from bathroom down <gasps> to bathroom, like on the seventh to the sixth oh, floor. Oh shit! Cops are called. Tarlin, they show up in four minutes, and it's like the crazy. The cops show up and they're laughing when they see it, you know, and then they said, what happened? He said, I recently became a born again Christian. He snapped back into it <laughs> and covered. And they said the cop, yeah, I covered it. And the cop goes, my mother did that. You just got to learn to separate the doctrine from the reality. And then they walked away and it's uh, all in New York city. And then it was like, yeah, like because that, nothing set up for mental health. In any and way. also it just seemed like, and when he told that story, I laughed, I laughed and laughed and we thought he had smoked bad pot. Because he'd gotten high and then that happened. So he thought, and then. Because that's like every drug story any yeah, friend tells exactly. you. Exactly. And it's, it's like, like a high five when it's a drug story. It, yeah, exactly. It was like, that's the funniest story. I mean, I told that story to so many people. Yeah. And then when I live with him, I'm like, this is not good. And then I told my friend about it and she said, does he dress in layers? I'm like, yeah, a little. She said, that's a symptom of schizophrenia. I'm like, he doesn't have schizophrenia. Yeah. Well, because that's like saying. He has brain cancer. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's exactly. It was, you know, that's the thing. When he killed himself, 
it was like I'm like I just felt bad about it, but it was like it was like he got hit by a boulder. Right. You know, I didn't blame him for killing himself. It was like Can you imagine it's living hell he, to believe you're to honestly believe you're on fire. Yeah. Horrible. He, they told him you have schizophrenia, you're gonna be dying, you know, have to be a mess for the rest of your life. So then he just did it. He, fucked. he sent me a laptop too, back that I had loaned him back and I it was like so stupid. I'm like, Oh, he sent me the laptop. I didn't think about it and then I was like then I got a call from my friend. We had like a third friend in Orlando we grew up with. And then when he called, he called me in the morning and I was like, oh, Brandon's dead. You know, you're just like, you oh, just knew. I just knew Brandon yeah. is dead. Yeah. And then, cause I, this is not a guy who ever called me and he's called me in the morning. I'm like, that is not a good thing. Mm-mm, mm-mm. But also it's that thing of how do you turn around in, re- in normal life when you have plenty of problems of your own and all kinds of shit going on? How do you s- pull yourself out, turn around and be like, like there was nothing else you could do that be like you, as if you were supposed to somehow, yeah. you know, see it, manage it. That's the thing. Yeah. Like people blamed his parents. He went home to, to live with his parents. Like they should have seen something. I'm like, no, no I live way. with them. There's no, there's nothing you can do. And it's not like that. Even when we knew my mom would, she was going to get it. Like there, she spent a lot of time before she actually had it. My parents went on a shit ton of cruises and vacations. And now I realize it was my mom planning just like, let's get all this living out because I'm about to fucking fall apart. Really? I'm pretty sure because my parents probably went on vacation. I mean, they never weren't going away. When I was a senior in high school, me and my sister were home alone all the time. Because we had, we had they, parties so big that I we called the cops on our own party because like kids from the public school came and were like, we're fucked. This is out of control. And my parents were always gone. And at the time, I kind of resented it or like, oh, they, they're so selfish. What I realized now is my mom saw what happened to my grandmother, knew because she was a nurse that it, was, um, it came down on the mother's side. It was maternal. What are the percentages on the mother's side? It's how it's passed down. I know, but does that mean it's, is it dominant or recessive? Like, I'm not sure. And you can get a, I actually had a whole thing with my therapist where for a while I was going to get a test that told you whether or not you were going to get it. Yeah. And then I went to, I, so I talked to my therapist about it like for three sessions and then I went to my neurologist cause I have epilepsy seizure disorder, whatever. And, uh, I talked the royal to disease. <laughs> That's right. Well, and I used to have a big space between my teeth, so I clearly am of royal lineage. Genetically, you are just... Hello. <laughs> um, I, I so was you... actually mu- much more likely like a washerwoman in the royal houses, the raped washerwoman's child. But anyway. Uh, well, raped by royalty is still royalty. Is still yeah. getting a piece of that royalty. Um, so you went to the neurologist. My neurologist said, said, why? Don't do it. Live now like you live now like you. I'd be like, fuck you, man. I'm look. You're a neurologist, not a philosopher. No, he is a philosopher. He's one of the greatest men of all time. I love him so much. He every time I go see him, he's just like he's just clearly a very smart man. But also like the way he explained it to me is just like do the things now that you would do if you thought you were going to get it. Like don't eat a shit ton of sugar and all the things that are like technically you can prevent this. Blood pressure, walk every day. Sugar is a help, like sugar. Yeah, effects? because it it anything that will cause plaque in your brain, because that's that's where they say it starts from. But they also say that there is that they have a they have a either an like um they have a pill that's coming that that it's in the works, but they're just trying to figure out how to monetize it. If they it can and, beat AIDS, you got to think they could beat that. You would hope because the other thing is it's just going to cost like society too much money. If like 80% of the old people are like shitting and babbling in the street, it, you can't have it. Yeah, because once the old people got physically healthy enough to live, this became a big problem. Yes, exactly right. They're outliving their brains essentially. Yeah. Because most people got, you know, hit by trains when they were 52 or whatever. Or, or my grandfather, my great grandfather died of a shaving cut. No. It infected. There was no penicillin <gasps> in White Trash, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Game fucking over. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I didn't know the sugar cause. So do you try to live healthy because of that? I didn't say, do you? I said, do you try? <laughs> You're looking at me like, like I'm some sort of I've asshole. I've never been less healthy, but I think it's, it's, it's a combination of things, but I have been trying lately. I went through like post divorce. I went through like, basically I'm only going to eat McDonald's and lay on my couch for literally three years. And I'm coming. Sounds like a good three years. It was pretty great. Actually. Yeah. I didn't mind it. Um, 
Except for that I realized like I don't want to be alone the rest of my life. You got to find someone else who likes McDonald's. <laughs> are you doing are you doing the Tinder thing? Like what are you trying? Oh God, to- no, 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 no. I could never do that. Why not? Well, Tinder is for hot people. No. Well, yes and no. I agree with you there. Tinder is for hot short people is my theory. <laughs> so everyone in Los Angeles. Yeah. It's really perfect. Essentially. Like, it is funny. Like people, people ask me, do you do Tinder? I'm like, no, my face is awful. That's the <laughs> exactly. worst part. Exactly. Well, and also I don't, when I look at, I love to do my friends Tinder. Oh, I do too. I it, like write messages for my friend Adam, but like intentionally awful ones. Of course. And what's crazy is he's, but, good, he's good looking enough. It doesn't matter. There was one girl who was a swimming instructor and I said, I wrote, uh, I can't swim and I'm worried I might be black. And he goes, don't do that. And he ended up fucking her. Oh my God. Yeah. Because what you learn is you just write the craziest stuff and they don't care. Well, also you learn that people, I mean, I did laugh at that, but I'm more out of shock than anything else. But you learn that most people don't have good senses of humor. Oh, yeah. It's that thing too. It's just the, it's the, my thing is I, I need to meet someone who I know thinks the way I think and everybody on Tinder looks like the dumbest guy in your office. Like the guy that, well, you, know, you know, what that is. North face it's guy. also you, in fairness, you're choosing the attractive ones, which is what Tinder is made for. And then of course you end up with those people. I'm not, you're not using Tinder to you. You won't like look and well, your friends are choosing them. No, no, no. I'm what I'm saying is everybody, course, all the pictures, even the ones you say, no, say no to. I no. distrust attractive people. I personally... Didn't you just tell me you married one? I, but he liked me first. I would not have picked him, and I would not have thought that if he would really have picked me. If you really distrusted him, then you wouldn't have believed that he actually liked you. Well, he didn't really, and we ended up getting divorced. <laughs> you, I mean, that's kind of what happened. you get divorced because he didn't like you? I th- or because I didn't believe he did. Okay. I think that's really... It sounds like he did like you. I'm gonna, well, I, I hate to break this to you I, He may have, but he was not good at expressing it in any way that I could tell. Like, say rounding up all your family to say i'm going to propose to karen and then proposing to you in a public place just the it that can't be a one off like, though it can't be a one off you got it it's kind of be you got to check in every day and kind of act like you like a person oh yeah it's funny there there's two types of women either want the grand gesture guy or the i'm there steady guy yeah grand gestures are meaningless to me cuz anyone can like plan a picnic or you know, whatever it's funny i dated a girl who was all about grand gestures and i'm terrible at them so turns out i'm bad at day to day stuff too though I mean, it, you know what it is? It just takes like, you have to actually be interested. You have to, it has to be a thing that comes naturally. So yeah. if it's like, everything's a chore, then it's probably that person. Well, I, I'm also more of like a, I just don't do grand gestures at all. And then I guess I'll sit and talk, you know, I won't, won't stay silent. So you, you don't do Tinder. You spent three years eating McDonald's. Are you back? <laughs> are you back on the, uh, uh, not really. I mean, I go out now. now I leave my house sober now. now, right? Yeah, I've been, I haven't, I stopped drinking in 97. Oh, that's a long time. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. But, um, when but you... I stopped smoking pot like habitually. I do that. I, I do that off and on. And of course, pot was a big part of that laying on the couch and eating McDonald's. Okay. Yeah. So that's, I'm done with that too. Are you? I am actually. Cause it was starting to turn into like, were you everything smoking a lot when terrible. you were working? No, never. Really? Yeah. It's pot has changed the comedy store because it's uh, it's a lot less exciting because everybody is so fucking baked. Yeah. Uh, but it's a different sort of mindset, you know, but they are able to do their brains don't work, but they're able to do like simple tasks. Right. Now, I don't know if TV writing, some people can do that. Some people, but you actually have to be the boss. I have to be the boss. And also it's more of um, I, I am so compulsive. Like I just do everything compulsively. So smoking pot compulsively, the cumulative effect you know, was the word for that is addictive. Addictive. Yeah, <laughs> that's you, exactly compulsive right. Compulsive is like a real compulsive is a fun light. Yeah. What you say at the mall, um, but when you addictively compulsively smoke pot, the it really started to affect my. It was it was making me think like you should not leave the house. Like it's there's no hope. There's you're disgusting. Don't go outside don't trust anybody. Everything's bad. Only bad things are going to happen. And then I just realized I was like, okay, I'm, I have to stop doing this. And literally one week later, I was like, oh Jesus, that was 90% the pot just making me feel terrible all the time. So then have you pulled yourself out of it? Are you out there, Are you banging? Are you out there? I can't say that. I mean, the other part of it is, is doing stand up and being around mostly 28 year old dudes. It, for the most part, um, 
they, it, I just feel like everyone's aunt. I could see that. I, so could, I feel like that too. Yeah. Like uncle Dave. Yeah. Where it's like, I'm like, Oh shit. I got old. Yeah. I don't know when that happened. I but. got super old. Uh, but then you're still in comedy. So comedy is always kind of young. So you can kind of kid yourself a little bit a that little you're bit. like, I'm here at the party with the kids. And then I basically am like, I'm leaving. It's 1230. I have it's to like go. the door guys are always the same age. And I'm like, after all, I'm like, Oh shit. Like, you know, yeah. sometimes they'll look at me like, how do you know that? I'm like, cause I've seen it 20 times. Dude, I can't tell you how much, like when people are get really upset about like, so-and-so got a deal and they're not funny or whatever. And it's yeah. just like, oh yeah, that's, well, let's, let's mark the date and we'll talk about this in one year and we'll talk about where that person is. You can just yeah. calm the fuck down. I've been through 20 cycles of this. For me, it's also a girl will come to the store. I'm like, here's what's going to happen with her. <laughs> like, and then they're shocked. Like that happened. I'm like, uh, cause I've seen her when she was named this, this, and this. Yeah. Yeah. So are you out there banging? No. You're not having sex with dudes? No. Why not? Because I don't, I have, I don't have any confidence. You don't need confidence to have sex. Your, Look at every slut. Listen, <laughs> your hideous approach to love and life is not going to help me See, in this situation. when I hear hideous, I hear a pejorative and I, you, you maybe have this, your efficacious approach your specific and yet I don't, that's developed. a $10 word I don't know and that's so shaming to me it's effective it's it works wait my my approach oh yes that's fine that's fine but it has and nothing to do with me hideous uh yeah I, I don't understand look everybody can have sex no that's true so why aren't you it's not about confidence it is about confidence for me because I just can't. No, it's not. Well, you can't say. How the fuck would you know? Because I'm doing what I always do, which is assert <laughs> something about a person's internal monologue, which I could never know. And then, <laughs> then they argue and then I, I see what, what comes out of it. I can't. My, the confidence that I used to have, this is really the, the bottom line. When I started, uh, I, I started drinking when I was 15. Yeah. And so all the things, the, all the places where I think I would have gained actual real confidence in dating or with men uh, never stuck to me because I don't know how I got into half of those situations that I got into. If somebody liked me or if I liked them or if I ended up sleeping with them or they became my boyfriend or whatever, it was all very vague, a vague memory of last night. And so it was like, was I charming? How did I do it? I have no fucking clue. And so it's very upsetting to wake up as like a 30 year old and be like, holy shit, I'm actually at the maturity level in terms of relationships as a 15 year old. The classic is. addiction thing where when they sober up, they, they begin... Yep. So now what's your maturity level? So you'd be like in your thirties maturity wise. I mean, I guess so you're ready to get married. I guess so. But, it, but I think, uh, I don't know. I think it's such a different world out there. The way people like just have sex almost as like a handshake is so different than when I was in my twenties. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's new. Get the fuck out of here. It's not Kara. sex is new, but it's like, it's, it's not so, um, it's this, and not just the sex, but like everything around, like nobody, like if you fuck somebody, that's just what you did. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a relationship or like them, or it doesn't mean anything actually. I mean, so you, you think that's weird? What, were you going to deny that? No, I was going to oh. deny it. I was like, that seemed, you know, you, you spent like 15 years drinking yes. and presumably fucking. So yeah, I mean, I think so. So yeah, exactly. So it's not like sex was like the most important thing in the world to you. Cause drinking was, I'm just saying that you were able to do casual sex and now it's like, it's off the table, but I, but not in that way, not in the way people are doing it now. I think I would still like the person. You really do sound like an old, this Tinder with the I, kids. Really, I really fucking. am. I mean, that's why I would just call myself grandma all the time. Cause it's like, it just all seems very foreign to me and I just don't trust anybody or anything. Let's see, let's, that seems to me like the most important, blah, 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 blah. I don't trust, I don't trust anybody. anybody. Yeah, that's, all that is all. Thanks for waiting patiently and yeah, indulging me until I got, got around to the truth. I mean, really though, it's a very difficult town to no, it's first of all, people who cite the town, every dif every town's difficult. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it. I usually like comics or people that are funny. Well, that's a problem in and of itself. That's a humongous fucking problem. And then on top of that, you, I will meet people where I'm like, I don't know, this guy just started talking to me. And of course, and the end game is somebody wants a job or someone thinks that I can somehow make their career better. Wait, what? 
you saying guys, you think guys are trying to... That's definitely happened to me a minimum of three times where I th- somebody asked me out, I go out, and then eventually what I learn is... What they wanted to write on Ellen? I, they, <laughs> this is recently. They want a writing job or they want to figure out... Can you get them a writing job now? No, it doesn't work that way. That's I mean, I'm like, if, That's... if I got a job where I was the head writer... My question is, these guys still think you're going to get them work? It just seems ineffective as a... It's not a good plan, especially for me, because then I hate them when I realize that's what was actually going on. Then I feel stupid and... That happened happened three different times. That's happened with three different people. Okay, so let's go through this. The guys... how They must be new to comedy if they think you're going to be able to help and you can't. Well, new to writing. So they're comics and do they think you're... Not all of them are comics. Some of them were like, we just wanted to be comedy writers. Oh, Karen. Karen. <laughs> you're a dude. I'm such a you're dude. You're a dude. I'm a total dude. I mean, this this is like you this is like Okay, so you <laughs> <laughs> You I wish you guys could see the look on David's face right now because he loves this so much. You love this pain of mine. It's because I understand the pain. Because yeah. I've been through this pain. Yeah. And I'm surprised you're very, very smart. <laughs> and I'm always surprised when somebody smart does, you know, something dumb. It's yes. I find it gratifying. Yes, you know? of course. It makes you feel like I won up on them. Well, we're all fools in love. I mean, like... I guess w- that's true. When you go into something like that, I think it would be a bad thing if I started developing that, like, well, he, there's no way in like me, whatever. You like, say you, it would be a bad thing, but would it be a bad thing? Well... I mean, obviously, I, I it's, not. it's forward in my mind now, whereas before that, I couldn't imagine that that would be anything so anyone the would guy, do. So the guy, let's say the guy, so they, so you meet them, you hit it off and they're like, oh, you're making a face. Like, yeah, well, apparently you hit it off <laughs> enough to be hurt when you're being used. Well, not, not hurt as much as are you fucking kidding me? So you, you like, think, this is something I have to think about now, whereas so, I would have never thought about that Okay. Before. So you, you, the guy, you think, oh, that's something. Maybe we go on a date and then. And they, they find out you write for TV, obviously, early. And then you go out with them. And then when do you realize this is not like a sex thing? This is a... Um, different... Happened at different points. Different... Had you had sex with these people? No, no, no. This was... It was early each time. It was like, you know, because also everything's so casual these days. Or it's like hangout. Or these like... These days. Me, this is poster back in the 20s. Um, it's hangouty. You know, it's like, let's go to this. Let's go to that. Like, we're friends. And then I'm like, well, maybe we're, maybe he doesn't see me that way. It's that whole thing where you're kind of like, for me, it's trying to balance that thing of like, I'm not sure when people, I know that I can be very cold and standoffish. So if people are trying to extend themselves to me, it's got to be hard to be a woman and be because, like, as a nerdy, ugly guy, you learn, <laughs> you just learn this. You're like, oh, I have to be very direct very early because it's the only way I don't get chewed up emotionally. Right. Because I go to these things where I like them for a long time. They'd be interested. I, I think they're interested. I'd lie to myself. And then after like hanging out 20 times, like, what do you think? They're like, no, <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you? You're like, I waste a lot of time and I wrap myself up emotionally. And I'm like, after a while, I'm like, fuck that. Yeah. I'm like, do you want, like with a lot of girls, I'll be like, do you fuck ugly? I'll ask them early. And if a girl, that's a direct question. And if a girl, I don't do it every time, but I do it enough. If a girl goes, I go, what type of guy? And she goes, I like hot guys. I'm like, see you later. I walk away. It's good to know. Who but says that? You, you know what? A lot of girls do if they like hot guys or you, you ping to see what they, if a girl says, oh, that guy was so good looking. I'll see you later. Yeah. You like, wait, you listen, you listen for it. But you have to make yourself as a guy, but it, it helps you. If you're a guy, you really direct, but they say, no, you walk away. But as a woman, totally different ball game. Yeah. Hard to be direct and also have to receive, which is kind of a woman's thing. Yes, that's exactly right. And hard to be, I think, <laughs> forgive me, I'm going to say back in the nineties, but like in my day that being that way was more acceptable. The, the, that era of like, I mean, and I was drunk, but it was that kind of like, hey, fuck up, fuck yourself. And people were like, I love her. Like that was much more common. Whereas I think these days it's not, it's not as. Society's become more feminized. Society has, be, has become more. Uh, and I say that for men of, too. I think, yes, I think that's true. Like it's easier to be threatening. Yeah. Whereas I don't think that was seen as threatening as much as, oh, look at her go. 
You know what I mean? Like she's doing her thing. Whereas nowadays it's like, whoa, easy. You know, it's that. I had a woman tell me, she goes, you're so, uh, you're intense. And I was like, you work as a professional submissive. <laughs> That's really saying something. If was, she says you're intense. I was like, yeah, it wasn't, you know, it was crazy. I'm like, you get beaten up for a living and I'm intense. I'm a sweet, I'm a chemistry major. I'm a nerdy, sweet guy. Get the <laughs> fuck out of my face. Here's the thing too, David, is you keep saying like you're a nerd or you're ugly or blah, blah, blah. But you absolutely have confidence because yeah. you're putting yourself in that I know situation does. in this, in the first place. Yeah, every, every nerd I know is a bully. Yeah, but also you have the confidence to actually have that, to get that real with a person that you are interested in. Again, That's very vulnerable. Every nerd I know is like this. <laughs> really? The real one. Look, there's a whole belief, that nerdist culture where it's like, oh, I was put on, I was bullied. No, that's no. not how it was. I no. tell everybody this. The nerds that I went to college with at Carnegie Mellon, the really, really smart guys were fucking terrifying assholes. My friend Tableman is five foot two. <laughs> And he had, there was some fucking school assembly and it was in Maine and it's all white trash and he's talking and people are booing and he's like, you're going to look a bunch of gorillas. And some dude comes up to him and says, you really made an ass of yourself at their table. And he said, at least I made something of myself, which is more than you'll ever fucking be able to say. Uh... And then he walked away and it was like, yeah, that's, that's not like the story of like, God, these guys really bullied me in school. No. You know, real nerds are like that like aggressive dicks. Well, cause they're really smart. Yeah. Or something bored, just one entertainment. But I guess what I'm saying is you are, you are strong enough and confident enough to put yourself in that vulnerable position in the first place. And that's the place I can't get to right now. Karen, you, yes, you can, because this is an important <laughs> thing. This is really important. Look, is this, this is the best class I've ever not yeah, paid for. I'm telling you, this is really important to know. Y you're not vulnerable if you're not really putting yourself there. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, you know, but then what's the point? That's you trying to get laid. Yeah. I'm, t I'm an old every lady. It's a different thing. No, it's look, every relationship goes from sex to emotion, not from emotion to sex. I mean, that's true. Think I guess you're right. Your, all of your relationships too. You start off, you're you like, I'm fucking this person. I'm telling you, am I wrong? <laughs> I know nothing about your relationships, but in my experience. No, it's true. You're yeah. right. You're right. But that's horrifying to me at this point. It's not horrifying. It's you being insecure and telling yes. yourself. Yes. Well, it's I'm like what I was saying before. Like I didn't have sex for eight years. And after a while, your insecurity starts running the show. So you're just doing stuff and you commit yourself you do it for this reason, but it's just because of insecurity. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so in San Francisco in the 90s, I guess we're going to close on this. You <laughs> tweeted some story about a show you went to where Bono showed up with Winona Ryder. Yes. That's my favorite. I wish I hadn't tweeted that because Just tell it. Uh, okay. Um, it was the bottom of the hill, which was this awesome club in Potrero Hill. And there's a band called Zirkus. And we used to go see them all the time. My friend was fucking the lead singer. And they were a super cool band that was just great. And uh, so it was their last show. And so we all went and Why was it their last show? They were breaking up as a band, I guess. Or just because? I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, so the place was packed and there were two op opening bands and the middle opening band was a guy named, I think it was Gavin Friday. This guy that was tweeting and answering those tweets, uh, it was a huge Bono fan and he was kind of like arguing me like, S interesting story. Did you actually overhear that? Whatever. And I immediately got super pissy. I was like, who are you? But it turned out he was just tonally one of those kind of people that was like interesting story which i read it differently but anyway easy to do online it, it, you just if i have enough cups of coffee everyone's my enemy on twitter uh which i had to learn uh, the hard way then anyway so it i think it was a guy named gavin friday it was a it was a irish band um and they went second and then everyone stoked for Zirkus to to come on and i was sitting on top of a cigarette machine so i had this really awesome like bird's eye view of the whole club the stage the front door whatever and i see bono walk in with winona Ryder. and people as he walked up it was a pretty small club it wasn't like any huge place and as he walks up it was like along the bar people are turning and looking and then just turning back around which i loved because it was so this was back in the 90s when kurt cobain the you know yeah, everyone bono. the worst thing you could do is be a sellout you know, the worst thing you could do is be a commercial success. It was that whole mentality. Yeah, but I'll say this. That was also the peak of fucking you too. 
So yes. So he was like the enemy, really. The enemy, but also that's a big deal. It was a huge deal. And San Francisco is the 90s ish ist of any of those places like they want to hate fame and success more than anybody yeah they they hate los angeles um you know they want they want their world to rule and it doesn't so anyway so everybody was like don't look at him don't talk to him don't go up to him don't ask for his autograph the entire it was probably 300 people nobody looked at him nobody said hey bono or acted excited at all. I, I swear to God, I witnessed this. And there was an article about it in the paper that that can, if somebody finds it, I think it was either in the Chronicle or in the SF Weekly, somebody that was also there wrote a little article about San Francisco, did you did us proud, you know, or bottom of the hill, you did San Francisco proud by not kissing Bono's ass. So anyway, Bono walks in, looks around, sees that Zirkus is playing either for their first or second song, goes up to the owner, asks for the owner, the bartender has to go get the owner. The owner walks up and Bono says, put that second guy back up. D- demands that his friend's band goes on again because he missed their set and he wants to see them. And the owner said, go fuck yourself. And Bono turned around and stormed out with, with Winona Ryder in tow. And I, si- I did not hear, because a couple of people wrote and said, did you hear that conversation or whatever? And I didn't hear the words. I saw the owner's hand fly up. <laughs> and the universal I saw go the fuck look, yourself. Yes. Yeah. And the look on his face was like, what are you fucking talking about? And all the people that were nearby immediately ran and told everybody else that's what the owner said. So it's like on relatively good authority, third hand, basically. Yeah. But it was literally the second Bono and Winona Ryder left the whole place went crazy. It was the it was the best thing I've ever seen. That which was the reason I tweeted it in the first place. It was just this crazy, you know, ten minute moment of in supreme coolness. It, like it, it was just awesome. That's how important Bono is, though. Yes. Think about that. If for people to be rude to you and then cheer themselves for like <laughs> how proud they are, it's like that is a culturally massive figure. And to be so far along in fame and fortune that you think it's a reasonable thing to walk in and I say, want that. Yeah. take them off, put my friend back on like you're Louis the fucking 14th. Like, get out of here. There's a story about John Bonham. You ever heard the story about John Bonham? Was some was watching some band and the drummer sucked. So he gets on stage, he beats the drummer up, throws him <laughs> off, and starts playing the drums. Yes. And everybody was like, yeah, John Bonham played at the show. Not like, this madman beat up a stranger. <laughs> it's See, like I love fame. It. You fame, love it too. Yes, of course. <laughs> fame, it's just self-justification. It's like anything you do, you're the fucking... So if you're Bono, you were literally... The, I mean, everybody has that in them too, that we're all the protagonist in our stories. Of course. But not everybody else. But Bono's a protagonist in other people's stories too, like the time I met Bono. So, right, exactly. But here's the thing. You the reason that wasn't like a winning thing is because he wasn't there, I'll give these people a free show. He wasn't there to say, I'll give you all the Bono-ness of my oh, no, Bono. No, no. He was like, I want my way and everyone's just going to suffer for it. And these people, it's their last show ever. I have another way to look at up. this. Bono is such a good friend <laughs> that he wanted his friend to perform. He didn't want to hog the spotlight. He just wanted his friend to get to Bono perform. Bono is such a good friend that he's going to ruin the night of 300 hardworking American For his friend. paying customers. Hey, hey, you two Irish assholes. If that Take were the that com- back over the pond. If that were the comedy store, <laughs> <laughs> they would punch the comic in the face and drag him off. Like, Looks like your last show's over. <laughs> get up there, Chris D'Elia, <laughs> and have a great time. Do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I, I would live in San Francisco briefly, like around 99, 2000, but I was just like, uh, in the stock in the tech world. So I was there for six months. It was completely not cool. It was boring. No, it wasn't. It wasn't cool when I lived there either. Cause I lived there, I think from 2000, well, you guys were saying fuck you to Bono. That's way cooler than anything that was I pretty, did. that yeah. part was cool. But like in the day to day, I describe it as it felt like there was a really cool party happening and I had no idea where it was. Really? That's what San Francisco was like. It was like, felt like a big empty. Where in the city did you live? Uh, we lived in the upper hate the first year I lived there. And then in the mission, uh, back when the mission was actually still grimy back when the mission was like, you could truly get stabbed. Which was pretty cool. Yeah, I guess. Uh, okay, this, Karen, super interesting. 
good. You cried. That's always like I always. I cried, love that. but I came back from it in a in a way that didn't put anything on anybody. I did no, it no, Susan I, Sarandon I want, style. I want tears. I oh, want, you do. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, good. Good, it's good, like good. that. Uh, remember that SNL sketch, Bob Waltman, the Barbara Walters. It's oh Kevin, yes. <laughs> it's Kevin Nealon where he's like tear gassing people. Yeah, that's I love that. So okay, good. Some funny, some heart, and then we got to talk about something I love, which is Little House and McDonald's. Fuck. Overall, this is a real winner of a podcast. I'm, okay, I'm about to go get McDonald's if you want some. No, I can't do it anymore. You sure? I just can't. I can't afford it. I can, I, I'll buy it for you. No, you're very thin. You can do anything you want. I got to get back to my, I got to get back to Tinder weight, Tinder fighting weight. This is not about your weight. It's, it's about 100% your confidence about my weight. and your trust. That it all comes from one thing. And let me tell you thing. something about, about McDonald's is it's a great weight loss meal. <laughs> You it's, son of a bitch. It's really, you're not eating the right stuff. You're shaking the bag of smack in front of the heroin addict and saying, come on, it'll be fun. Yeah. When I was, when we were starting comedy, we were a couple years in and our friend was an alcoholic and there, it was a bad one. And, but nobody, he hadn't drunk in a long time. And somebody was like, oh, we, we got, uh, we got him drunk. And I'm like, you know, that's a bad thing, right? <laughs> he's a drunk. And they go, no, he's a fun drunk. And it was within six months he was out of comedy. Yeah. I mean, it was it was such a quick spiral down, but everyone's like, no, it's totally cool. Come on. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Of I'm course. seriously going to try to talk you into McDonald's after this. I'm not doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. That was Karen Kilgariff. Follow her on Twitter at Karen Kilgariff. That's K-A-R-E-N-K-I-L-G-A-R-I-F-F. And listen to her podcast with the very funny Chris Fairbanks called do you need a ride? Which, come to think of it, could also describe the opening credits of Highway to Heaven. As always, my Twitter is at this David Taylor. I'm David Taylor, 